Oh, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to our uh, sixth edition of Let's Write an Adventure, where we are writing a D&D &D adventure in real time uh, here on our live stream channel. So, uh, as if you've been following along, you'll, you'll know that we're currently working on an adventure that we brainstormed at the first session um, where the characters are hired by a, uh, the leader of a community, yet to be named, to recover the only known deposit of cold iron, our MacGuffin, uh, which is a, a, a special material that is powerful against Fae. It was lost in a glacial mine once ravaged by disease. The community needs it to save themselves from the foretold coming of the Blood Sisters' Hag Coven. Um, and the players are led to believe the village plans to fight these powerful uh, hags, these powerful fae, uh, when they recover the cold iron. But when they return, they discover that the village actually intends to use the cold iron to pay off the coven, thus completing an ancient pact. Uh, and so the party has to decide whether to support empowering this coven with this fae-slaying uh, cold iron uh, or to convince the community to fight back, knowing there's going to be consequences no matter what they choose. Um, so we were working on building out the glacial mine section of this, uh, which is eventually going to need its own name, a proper name for the place, because just glacial mine is, isn't exactly terribly evocative. But we'll get to that. Um, first things first, I'll move my my bobble-headed face over here. Um, we were, we had spent some time brainstorming locations that might appear in this mine, realizing that it also probably needed to be something of a fortress. And so it kind of ends up split into these two layers where you have the, the fortress section and then we have the, the mine section uh, beneath that. Um, and then we were talking about, you know, our, our MacGuffin would be kept in the special cold iron storage section. This is such a, a precious material. Uh, it would have to be, it would be segregated from everything else. It would be kept under lock and key. And in this case, we decided that it's actually a door with three keys that the players will need, or the characters rather, will need to find by searching the rest of the facility. And we went ahead and spread our keys around. First things, we hid one in the mine tunnels where we have a hard to deadly encounter where we have uh, ghouls that are hunting the party when they enter in there. Um, and I've actually been thinking over the week that it might be really fun to have these ghouls um, hunting the party throughout the mine level. So not just in the mine tunnels themselves, but um, you know, in the, the ore processing, um, you know, equipment storage, you know, anything, any other area that we've kind of built down into this mine level here as we, as we work through that so that perhaps the ghouls become aware of them uh, in the mine slope or mine shaft section. Um, and I like this because it helps us uh, build, gives us a lot of room to build some suspense, right? Suspense isn't something you can just turn on like a light switch. It's really got to layer it on. Um, and making this clear distinction between the fortress level and then the, the mine level gives us a, a, a nice dividing line where, you know, perhaps if this is a mine shaft as opposed to a mine slope, we can have, or either way, I guess technically it would be working in either case, but, we're, but we have this, this transition narrative from where we go from whatever the mood of the garris of the, um, of the fortress level is down to a, uh, a much more ominous environment in the mine itself. Um, and as they explore, we can start to layer in signs of, of these dead down here lurking just in the shadows. We can have them do these little ambush attacks. Um, as we've mentioned here, this ambush and fade um, kind of thing, putting, keeping the players on their, uh, keeping the, the characters on their toes uh, as they work their way through trying to find this key. So um, we know that the key will be here somewhere in the mine tunnels. We'll probably need to figure out what the criteria are for finding it, per se. All right, and we may end up moving it around somewhere, too, especially if the mine tunnels become kind of a ubiquitous environment here. Um, but this is just an example of things that might shift as we build this out. Um, you know, as we have uh, a good idea about a really cool kind of uh, encounter for the, for the players, something that really makes them feel and makes them think, 
uh, and affects how they strategize and approach the situation, um, it, uh, it's, it's worth making some accommodations in the rest of your design for that. Um, you know, fun, right, is the number one objective for D&D. &D. Really, it's the only thing that has to occur during a D&D &D session is that everybody needs to have fun. Um, so if we come up with something that we think would be a lot of fun to run and a lot of fun to play, um, well, then that takes priority over the rest. So um, that being said, so we've got, uh, you know, one key that will be found somewhere in the mines. We've got one that we're thinking was kept with the Forge Master. Um, and uh, we came up with the idea last time of a, um, of a ghost, the ghost of the Forge Master bound into the Forge, um, forever trying to complete her final masterpiece that, that so far remains unfinished and that the players, or the characters rather, I don't know why I keep flip-flopping those words today, that it is an important distinction. Um, the characters uh, would discover that they can acquire this key by helping her complete her masterpiece, which we decided was um, an item called uh, the cold iron armor, um, which we sort of started sketching out a little bit in that it um, uh, it provides, you know, it can be any kind of, of, of metallic armor, um, but that it provides uh, the ability to cast um, protection from evil and good uh, up to three times per day currently. We'll see how that susses out. That may get adjusted. It may end up being a once a day kind of thing. Who knows? Um, uh, but yeah, so that, you know, they can help, uh, if they help her complete her masterpiece, they can get the key from her. Um, and then we talked about a couple ways to do that, perhaps a skill challenge with tool proficiencies, um, or maybe even something that involves uh, possession by the ghost herself, creating a ghost incident, like the verified yes, Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore um, uh, kind of moment <laughs> um, in here. So something to think about, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, you know, it, that idea made me laugh. And so if I was doing this for myself, I would probably work that in there. Because you've got to, you need to have fun with this, right? Um, it's got to be fun for you, too, as the DM to run. So if you occasionally sprinkle in things that just make you giggle to yourself on the other side of the DM screen, leave them in. It's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll continue kind of fleshing this out as we, um, later on in the process, as we kind of move around. We're still really sketching out elements here. So we don't have to really get married to any particular details yet um, as we kind of winnow this down uh, to things that we really like. Um, and so our third key we decided was probably gonna be up in the garrison kept by whoever the, you know, the, the captain of the guard was here. Um, and so uh, the garrison, you know, uh, garrisons are where the, the soldiers would have lived, right? And so we'd have bunk rooms, we'd probably have a small mess, we'd have some community space, that kind of stuff there. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's a relatively sizable structure in and of itself, which gives us some stuff to play with. Obviously it lends itself immediately to the idea of, you know, undead warriors there to protect it, you know, stuck in there, their final call of duty to protect uh, this key and perhaps another allotment of treasure down here. Um, that might be an interesting place to put some something special um, for the players to find in here. Um, I generally save treasure treasure, so not like story items, but like, you know, the gold, the magic items, and the spell scrolls and stuff that they're going to find. It's usually one of the last steps that I, uh, uh, of making, making any adventure for me. Um, but that's just because I, I really like to be very um, judicious about the amount of treasure that I put into an adventure. Um, not because it's necessarily game-breaking game to do more, but the m but it's a fine it's a fine balance, right? Like because the more often that you give players magical items, the less value that moment has for them. Right? And I say less emotional value is what I mean here. So if I'm, you know, every game we dole out a magic item, you know, that's cool, but eventually they, 
it's just like, okay, well, what's my item this level? You've got to really continue to up the ante for it to have that same feel of like, oh, I just got a magic sword. Like, you lose some of that resonance. At the same time, if you're really stingy about magic items, um, the players feel a little cheated because there is an expectation of getting magic in D&D. &D. Um, and so I'll usually kind of build out the whole adventure and then go to the end and uh, go to Xanathar's guide and think about, okay, well, what level is this? How many items should really be in here? I'll take that number and I'll usually either increase it by 50% or, or perhaps double it, depending on how well I hide stuff in here, because they're gonna, your player's are gonna miss stuff, your character's are gonna miss stuff. Um, and, uh, and then I'll sprinkle it in, so that way it's kind of evenly distributed, I gotta feel for where things are. I find that if I just kinda add it ad hoc as I go in, and I end up with like two rooms that have big piles of treasure, and, and it just don't work for me. Um, but it's up to you, if you are kind of working your way through this and you have a really great idea for treasure to put somewhere, um, you know, it, it's worth adding it in, knowing you can always massage it later if you need to. Um, and the same kind of goes with gold. There, there isn't a good rule of thumb out there, that I found at least, that's kind of universal in terms of how much gold should be an adventure. I usually, there's an argument that if you were to go through and calculate all the experience points that a character is supposed to get over the course of the adventure, that, that they should have the possibility of, of, of getting one gold piece for each experience point that they might receive in there. Um, and that's not a bad rule of thumb, especially if you kind of divide that up through everything, including the reward for completing the adventure and that kind of stuff. Um, that can work pretty well. Um, you know, what I will do often is I'll go through and say, okay, you know, between levels one and five, you know, that, that first tier, um, or levels one and four, I will, uh, um, I'll figure out how many treasure hordes I want them to find, you know? And so for example, like in this, I might say, okay, well, there's, there's one or two treasure hordes in this whole adventure and I'll roll those up in the DMG and then I'll divide that out throughout this. Um, you know, I, I go back and forth between those because uh, sometimes you get a little more magic, a little less magic, a little more gold, a little less gold. Um, it feels less um, formulaic, um, so it's a little more organic. I, I like to play with it that way, but either method works. Um, I will say that one thing to really consider when you're giving out gold is what is there to spend gold on in your adventure, um, because if there's nothing for them to buy, then gold is kind of meaningless. Um, so instead of just hurling out a whole bunch of gold and go, hey, you found a pile of gold, don't you feel good for the treasure? You turn that into something they might use. So if you're doing a campaign where you kind of hand wave um, things like uh, you know rations or um, the standard of, of living that, uh, that players have to, to pay for, uh, their expenses in town, that kind of stuff. Um, or you don't worry about counting arrows and all that kind of jazz. Um, then yeah, gold isn't isn't a big selling point to your characters. They'll amass thousands of it with nothing to spend it on, nothing to do with it. Um, you know, in that case, I'd say turn it into potions, turn it into uh, spell scrolls uh, that they can find, that kind of stuff. Um, but if you're doing a, a real gritty campaign um, where they, you know, they're paying for everything, then gold has some serious value. Because uh, it keeps them from uh, encountering things like having getting exhaustion from not eating enough or drinking enough, um, or perhaps you know getting robbed in town if they don't stay in a nice enough place, or or being exposed to disease, that kind of deal. And for that reason alone, I like to do gritty encounters. I think or gritty games. I think they're they're a lot of fun that way. They add a lot of um, it adds a, a level of logistics um, and difficulty to the adventure that that I personally enjoy. But it's not for every table. All right, um, I'm getting off on tangent here. This all came from the idea of um, we might want some other treasure in the garrison as well. So we'll say plus some other cool item, um, perhaps. So, um, so we'll put that in there because we might add that later. But when it comes to an encounter in the garrison, we can get fancy and we can try to think of something super cool um, and perhaps something that is um, completely novel. But I'll be honest, I'm kind of feeling a good old fashioned fight here. We don't really have a good old fashioned fight. We've got 
ambushes, uh, and then we've got uh, a, you know, a social encounter, if you will, here. Um, a good old-fashioned brawl is just fun sometimes. So I think maybe we do one here. Um, I like the idea of skeletons. Um, and so maybe we can do something like that. That fits into our undead theme here. But let's kind of see how that, how that shakes out. Um, I will say that when I'm writing just, uh, just a fight, like a combat encounter, um, I do a couple things. Um, one, I'll kind of figure out what's level appropriate for our characters. Um, and then two, I will, um, I try to think about what is the objective of the creature that's being fought, uh, because that will influence some of the tactics. Like, you know, we have a clear objective for the ghouls. They want to eat the players. They want to eat the characters, not the players. It'd be bad if they ate the players. They want to eat the characters, um, which is bad, but still, but less bad. Um, and so they have a clear objective that informs their tactics. They attack, and if they're, you know, take enough damage, they're driven off. You know, they, they don't risk dying to obtain that meal. They, it's better for them to wear it down. So a lot of ambush tactics. The garrisons seems more like a defensive kind of place, right? So they're probably there to defend something specific. And that's probably our other cool item here. And the key is collateral. Um, and this kind of does an, another thing that I, the third thing that I really like to do in encounters, and that's, um, I like to insert competing objectives where there's two things that are going on that the players need, that the characters need to deal with. Um, and one of them is always, you know, winning the fight. There's, you know, we've got to not die, right? You know, and the other, oh, pardon me is the um, is 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 something else that we work in there something else that's time sensitive and has to be dealt with right now during the combat because um, it does a couple of things one it keeps it from just being a like you know I swing my sword I swing my sword again kind of you know combat where it's just you know rock'em sock'em robots just doling out hits um, it adds some texture to this where you have some characters who are, who are focusing on the combat and some characters are focusing on solving the other problem. Um, and it also encourages players to think a little cre creatively, right? Because um, there, there is such a natural flow to how just straight combat works, where it's, I'm gonna do whatever deals the most damage in this moment. Um, whereas if you add an additional objective in there somewhere, well, then they have to think, you know, am I better off dealing damage right now? Or am I better off trying to move us closer to solving that problem over there? You know, the classic example of this is like, you know, a ritual being performed while combat is going on. And that's, in fact, probably something that we'll use when we get to the resolution portion of this campaign or this adventure where the, the players, or I'm sorry, the, the big bad encounter where the, um, where the characters have to uh, deal with the, uh, uh, the hag coven. Um, you know, they're great for rituals being, you know, enacted where we you know, might have to fight and then deal with this ritual because if the ritual is completed, the fight, you know, winning the fight will be meaningless kind of deal. So we'll, we'll see some of that um, in a very classic sense when we get there. But for here, you know, having them defend something um, I think is a good place to start. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's, let's figure out kind of what kind of what scale we're looking for here. So let's go to this encounter builder. Let's manage characters and get out of my, um, I'm just messing around campaign there. And these are level three that we were calibrating for. So let's do that. Uh, I said four, okay. So let's get some skeletons in here. So skeleton kind of our one to four, all right. So these guys can handle a lot of skeletons, which lends itself well. Let's see here. We got to like eight skeletons. That makes it hard. We could do that. Let's see how it stacks on Xanathar's to just kind of see the vibe there as well. 
and what we want to do. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Scroll down to our chapter two, Dungeon Master's Tools and Counter Builder section. We're at level three. Okay, so yeah, so it kind of tracks along the same level here where we're saying, uh, you know, each one of the players can can take on, each one of the characters can take on uh, up to two, uh, you know, one-fourth challenge rating monsters to have, make this a, 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 a difficult but, but winnable fight, which I think is kind of what we're going for here, at least at the core. Um, especially if we're going to give multiple kind of objectives here. So, you know, so I think skeletons are probably a good track there. We might add in something to be, you know, a skeleton, the, the skeleton boss or what have you, you know, whoever the, the, whoever the captain of the guard is in this. Um, maybe we can use something like, you know, a minotaur skeleton or something along those lines. Skeletal commander, if you have Laird or Ferris. Um, yeah, all kinds of options here we might work with. Um, what happens if we add in a Minotaur skeleton? Where does that go to? That was tough. That being said, we could have we could have the boss, our our our, our captain of the guard, guarding something specific um you know so not necessarily engaged in the fight and that's another thing if you do kind of competing objectives um you could have a contingent you, you calibrate the fight based off of the the warriors that the the enemies the npcs that are going to be fighting um to calibrate the encounter and then you have others that are doing whatever the thing is that need to be stopped or protecting the thing that needs to be protected or what have you um and they don't really count into the challenge rating initially um you know they only they end up coming in kind of like reinforcements, right? Where they're where they're filling in uh, spaces as as the players defeat other enemies or or engage uh, the uh, that group specifically. So it can allow you to increase the difficulty without necessarily increasing the threat of death, um, if you will. So it's something to Something to think about here. So let's let's go with skeletons for sure. So let's say um, uh, the garrison. Or should say the remaining garrison troops. Wow, helps if I actually spell right. Garrison troops um, have risen as. Skeletons um, determined to protect uh, their final charge. Uh, we could say which is what. Um, hmm. Respect to their final charge. We'll have to figure out what it is that's so important to them. Because having something in here that they have to defend could explain why they stayed behind and were overcome by the disease. So we'll have to think about what what would what would cause them to do that. We'll have to think about that. But um let's see here. The characters must take them the cold iron storage key. Um, skeletons defend it with their lives. We'll say with their own lives. Because they're not alive. All right. Um, we'll say eight ish skeletons. Let's 
get that nomenclature kind of in the ballpark we're looking for. Let's get that here so we can put the URL, copy, and make this easy to, uh, oops, wrong, wrong tab. That easy to uh, to find later. Okay, um, so we're thinking eight of skeletons there. So combat, um, we can definitely ask ourselves the question: um, What else are the skeletons protecting, and why will the characters need to deal? I could almost see there being something like, you know, maybe maybe somebody important in the facility, you know, somebody who was originally important in this mine um, contracted the disease and now they couldn't cure it, but they could, you know, halt their death, put them in this state of, of um, sort of um, suspension, right, where they're dormant there, like in a, you know, in a coma, if you will, a magical kind of coma. Um, but they're not, you know, but, but there isn't the means to heal them. And so they continue to stay behind with the, uh, you know, the healers who are, you know, who are now again undead and kind of maintaining this, this stasis. Um, and they're defending that. But perhaps the key is, is held by um, the person who is, uh, who's in stasis. So in this case, uh, you know, the, the garrison commander, uh, the captain guard, might be our person for that, um, assuming they're the one who has the key. We've just, if we've decided they're the one who has the key. Um, so, yeah, so this could be like a, a loyalty beyond death kind of deal, which I think is kind of kind of cool, and it um, adds a layer to this. Um, and it could also have, like, it could give us a cool twist and turn end here so um so yeah so what if we do that what if we say um the final charge so let's let's answer that let's say we know what that is um uh, let's say to protect their final charge um their uh, we'll say the garrison commander. Okay. Uh, we can give ourselves a little background here. The garrison commander now becomes a proper noun kind of deal, right? So let's give it a, some capitals, because unless we're going to give this, you know, this this creature a name, a proper name, which we might do later. We'll see. The garrison commander. Uh, is the keeper of the cold storage key early in the um, early in the outbreak of the plague? Uh, we'll go with he for this. We've got she for the for the forge master. So let's go with he. It doesn't really matter though. Sometimes when I write an adventure, I just won't assign a gender and we'll just, you know, pick one if it becomes relevant or just ignore it altogether. It's entirely to you, whatever is easiest for you. Um, we'll go with he with this one and we'll throw in some some more gender neutral stuff later. Um, again, you know, kind of scale that to your players. Um, you know. Representation is really important in these games, and so it is. It's a good idea to have a, a mix of as many different kinds of people uh, as NPCs in your game as possible. But you know, I mean, don't don't beat yourself up over it. Um, you know, calibrate your guide on on how much to do of anything uh, based off of off of your players and and what's important to you and your value system. Um, again, this game is about having fun so it's it so it's it's useful to make it as inclusive as possible 
but you know, don't flog yourself if you have a few many, few too many female characters, a few too many male characters, or um, you know, or some group is not represented, you know, in in a particular adventure. Just have them in in a future adventure and, and move on. Um, all right, so let's say uh, early on the break of the plague, he contracted the disease, which we're going to need to define here very soon, I think. But he contracted the disease and was placed in a state of um, suspended animation, suspended animation to await cure. The cure never came, but the healers and guards remained uh, carrying their duty out beyond the grave. Dun, dun, dun. All right. Um, Cool. So that means we've got eight eight-ish skeleton guards. Guards. All right. So that's our you know our core initial combat group. There. Um, we probably need a few healers of a sort. Um, when it comes to stuff like that, I will usually reskin an NPC as opposed to having to create a new stat block. Because that's super simple. So let's drop that for the moment. And get rid of those. And we'll say something along the lines of um, Acolyte. Seems kind of a deal. Um, and that's about the, the challenge rating we're looking for here, right? Like an additional uh, one quarter here. Yeah, and just out of curiosity, you know, if we bump that number up to, you know, yeah, you can add probably three acolytes will add in there, especially since they're not necessarily going to, um, they're going to focus on, on on maintaining this ritual as opposed to, um, you know, throwing themselves into the fray. They've got their own thing they need to do. Um, and so let's say, so let's remove the eight-ish and let's say eight skeletal guards. And then we'll say three, uh, let's see here, we'll say three acolytes. Let's, let's take that and get their URL here so that when we run this, we have a much easier time. Okay, cool. Link that. Link to web page. Let's do it. Oh, okay. And then um, let's make a note that... Um, they are undead instead of humanoid. Cool. Um, yeah, so changing little things like that can can really save you some time. Um, instead of feeling like you have to create a completely new stat block from scratch, just pick one that works and you know change what you need to. Um, especially if you're just changing spells out or uh, changing uh, the, the creature type, that doesn't affect the challenge rating at all. Um, really, the only things that affect the challenge rating are um, defensive things. So, you know, their AC and hit points um, and, uh, you know, immunities and resistances. Um, and then the attack options, right? So number of attacks will affect uh, challenge rating as will um, their average output per turn, damage output per turn, um, and then, uh, you know, spell save DCs or, uh, um, or their to hit bonus, that kind of stuff will, um, the, there's a chapter in the dungeon master's guide that really breaks down how that works and how that shifts with the challenge rating. So if you really want to get in the weeds and make your own stat block, you can, um, but I tend to save that for really specific moments when, when tweaking something else just won't do. Um, okay, so we've got uh, our eight skeleton guards or three acolytes. Um, three acolytes uh, focus all their energy on maintaining the uh, uh, 
maintain their commander's state of uh, suspended animation. This uses their action every turn. Um, however, after the first is slain, the ritual is broken and they um, join the fray. Cool. Um, yeah, so building in here that they're kind of, you know, reserves um, as, the, uh, as the players deal with the initial threat. Um, okay, uh, and then of course we need our garrison commander. And we'll say uh, the garrison commander is, oh, actually we'll just do that as defining what creature type he is. Because I, so if he's in suspended animation, um, I kind of like the idea of, you know, he's got the key around his neck, um, you know, classic kind of gatekeeper, medieval gatekeeper kind of style. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's stuck in this state of suspended animation, um, you know, perhaps uh, anointed with ritual oils and shrouded in a ritual shroud and that kind of deal. Um, and then, you know, after his, his guards and his acolytes are defeated and the spell is broken, uh, he rises as the undead himself, as one final, um, you know, creature that the uh, uh, that the characters have to face. Um, I love the idea of making him a mummy. Um, I think that just kind of, I don't know, that's kind of a cool vibe to me. I think. That being said, that's might be too beefy for this. Let's see. Um, Mummy. You know, maybe not, especially if, if he's, if everybody else has been defeated. Um, and Xanathar's would say that, you know, a third level, that you'd be looking at six of them to go against. But that being said, uh, you know, I mean, again, you know, four creatures are one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, that's a, it's probably, a, a, again, a medium difficulty kind of encounter here. Um, I kind of like that. So when you're making encounters, something to be aware of is that it is almost impossible to um, completely accurately predict how difficult an encounter is going to be for your players. Yes, these are all great guidelines and great places to jump off with. Um, but you know, you know, no matter how meticulous you get on this, some encounters are going to be harder than you expect, and some are going to be easier than you expect. I find that I tend to err on the side of making them a little too difficult because I can always... I can always make the monsters make mistakes. Right? Um, that seems natural, as long as it's not like, oh, he just doesn't attack you this turn. But, you know, you know a monster's attention, you know, instead of all... You know, all teaming up against one, one character, which is you know objectively their best tactic. You know, is to take down the party, you know, character by character. Um, I can spread out some of the attacks. I can you know have an attack miss if I needed to. Um, it's maybe just psychologically, I think it's a lot easier to say something misses when it you know. To, it's psychologically, I think a lot easier to turn a hit into a miss. For DM than it is to turn a miss into a hit. It feels a little feels a little kinder, um, I think. Um, and you can always you know reduce hit points or something along those lines. You can uh, you know you can add elements to the environment that that make it more difficult for the enemy, perhaps uh, that kind of stuff. So so I'd say err on the side of more difficult. Um, because I think it's just a lot easier to tone it down than it is to, to dial it up. So let's make the commander mummy. Let's see here, commander, bold, mummy. Um, and let's 
get our URL there so we make it easy on ourselves. Um, cool. Um, the commander um, dies if the ritual is broken. He raises as the undead after, let's say, two turns. Right. So let's uh, let's give let's give the the characters a moment or two to to kind of mop up everybody else, and then have to deal with this mummy. Um, knowing that they're going to be damaged uh, and they're going to have spell slots that are expended. They're not going to be at full power when we get into, into this encounter, which again does affect the difficulty, right? Um, but worthwhile to have in here, um, especially since they're kind of doing all of these back to back without a short rest potentially. Um, so each encounter makes this a little more challenging. So this could be a, a really tough fight for them and thus a very cool moment for them when they win, right? Um, it is far more enjoyable for players to come out victorious after a, just a really tough fight. They're going to be on a, a much, they're going to be on an emotional high when they do that, um, as opposed to just kind of waltzing through and laying waste to everything. Challenge gives everything more value, um, so long as they succeed. And we want them to succeed. TPKs aren't fun for anybody. Um, all right. And so to that end, uh, you know, the mummy also has this, um, has this mummy's rot disease. I mean, it's a curse in here, but it's kind of a disease. Um, let's see. It's thematically really nice with a, a, a mind that's been afflicted by this disease. Maybe, maybe we do something with this disease. Maybe we use, maybe we base the disease off of mummy's rot, potentially. So what does it say here? The cursed target can't regain hit points and its hit point maximum decreases by 10 for every 24 hours that elapse. If the curse reduces the target to hit points maximum zero, the target dies. Um, oh, it has to be removed curse. Ooh, that's, uh, that is interesting because that's going to be a third level, which means fifth level characters having access to that. Mm hmm. It's an interesting, that's an interesting thing to watch out for here. It may cause us to swap this, swap our commander out for something else. Um, because, you know, a, a DC 12 is not out of the ballpark for third level characters to deal with, right? In fact, they'll probably succeed, but if they don't, they have to find, they have to have some way to remove that curse or else it's a permanent, you know, it's, you know, it becomes an auto death for whomever becomes afflicted. Hmm. So that may mean that we need to find, that we'll need to put spell scrolls, remove curse or something along those lines um, somewhere else in the facility, you know, uh, hmm, we don't have like a, a library or, um, um, or some other sort of, you know, reading room or scriptorium or anything like that. Let's, what, uh, yeah, we'll uh, add it too. Let's add one just in case some place that we can toss some scrolls in here. Um, so let's see, library, TBD. Um, yeah, because we also don't have like an infirmary in here or anything like that. That might be worth adding. Again, we're, you know, we may end up cutting some of this stuff out. We may not, we'll see. Infirmary, but these are things that, that would likely exist. So um, we should say among, let's see, contains um, 
needs to be more than one spell scroll. We'll say for now, contains four spell scrolls of remove curse. Um, we'll put that in here potentially for the moment. Now, something to note here, right, um, is that remove curse is a higher level spell than any of your characters are going to have access to, um, which means that they still have to make a roll. They can they can try to cast it off the scroll, but they're going to have to they're going to have to make a roll. Um, it's a third level spell, uh, and so the DC for that kind of thing is it's a it's usually an Arcana check um, of a. Uh, DC is equal to 10 plus the spell's level. So you'd be looking at a DC 13 arcana check. You might make the argument that a religion check could work or if you're a druid, maybe a nature check, you know, whatever you want to use for that. Um, but we can say DC 13 to cast to just kind of give ourselves a, a, a note here. Um, you know, especially if the, if the characters have explored this facility enough to find the library um, or the infirmary, you know, they might, these things might be hidden in here. Um, we might, we might give them, we might have to put in some clues at some point that they could find this ability to remove curse and potentially cure themselves if money's rot. Or we might have to change out the monster. I kind of like keeping it in, though, creating this other layer of, like, you know, oh, crap, we caught this disease. Um, we could also make some changes to the mummy rot and make it a different disease that's perhaps more in line with the disease that we have going on here. Because seeing that it can has to be removed by removed curse means that it's not the disease that we want to use for our facility, right, where we're, where we're talking about those pockets of gaseous disease that just exist here. Um, because that's, that will become, that will make places in this facility auto-death, which auto-death is rarely a good idea uh, when, you're, when you're planning these things. Um, places where it's acceptable to use auto-death kind of deal is when you know you're fighting a lich um, and you have like power word kill because by the time that the players are, are strong enough to do that kind of thing, um, they can have the tools to avoid that. You know, counter spell. Um, you know, having enough hit points that it isn't effective. Um, being able to cast things like Revivify, that kind of deal. But at this level, auto deaths should be completely off the table. So, speaking of that, we've only got a what you know. 12 more minutes or so in our stream. So maybe let's take a moment and kind of brainstorm some ideas for this disease since we kind of keep coming back to it. So to that end, let's start by going back to our DMG. Ye old DMG. The font of all knowledge in DMG, which is actually probably an exaggeration, but it's still immensely useful. So let's see, diseases, show me diseases. Um, okay, so they've got a couple uh, example diseases in here, but you know we can make our own, um, but they're a good place to kind of um, work, you know, work out from. Um, so you can, we can kind of, you know, glance through this and see what sounds good mechanically and then add the flavor to it as we, as we see fit. Other good places, nothing, you know, if you're looking for disease and this doesn't jump out at you, um, Tomb of Annihilation has got some good diseases that have been added in there um, that we might take a look at and kind of get a vibe for that as well. Let's see here. Oh, symptoms manifest uh, 24 hours. I like, I like diseases that manifest quickly for dungeon encounters and then during travel, diseases that manifest a little more slowly um, are useful. Um, let's see, your infected creatures need one level of exhaustion, can't be removed, disease is cured. Uh, any event that causes it, infected creatures, creatures stress, including uh, do, 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 forces. Yeah, it takes damage, it becomes incapacitated with mad laughter one minute, and then you know, each of its turns. 
yeah, you know, it's it can be interesting. Something like cackle fever, where we're where we're getting that exhaustion, and we're also um, potentially getting um, incapacitated, taking psychic damage during the process. If it was something like cackle fever, um, that uh, uh, that would add an interesting element to this in terms of. Uh, in terms, in terms of what the atmosphere of this um, of our glacial mine of the fortress, because if one of the things it does is makes you have these fits of screeching laughter, there would probably be skeletons, dead bodies laying around um, that are kind of caught in the rigors of that. You know, so we could have skeletal faces that are that that are stretched into these almost Joker esque kind of laughs. Um, yeah, that could be cool. That could add an, a, a a very eerie element to this. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and it says any humanoid creature that starts a turn within 10 feet of an infected creature in the throes of mad laughter must succeed at DC 10 constitution saving throw or become infected with the disease. This you succeed in the save, it's immune to mad laughter for uh, uh, of that particular infected creature for 24 hours. Um, yeah, so we could reskin this to do, it's almost the same thing, but now it's instead of being transferred by a creature, although we could include that. We could still have pockets of gas that transfer it. And I also even like the idea of, you know, almost all humanoids are affected except gnomes. Because that, again, adds another layer for your players that, you know, if you have a, a gnome character in the group, um, you know, they might now be encouraged to be the one that kind of um, hunts around and scouts ahead, even if they're not the rogue, because they're not going to be susceptible to this disease. Although the characters won't, will have to figure that out the hard way, right? There's no way for them to know that out the gate, especially if we don't use, if we don't call it cackle fever, we call it something else. Sometimes that's enough. Just change the name on something so that you know veteran players aren't familiar with the mechanics straight out the gate, uh, and so that doesn't affect. Um, you know, that doesn't inf influence them. They won't metagame with that information. You know, because let's be honest, despite your best intentions, you know, there's plenty of players who work really hard not to metagame, but they know a lot about the game. And so sometimes it's hard to to not act on information that you know um, without even really thinking about it. You know, you, you know they, they jump to conclusions, correct conclusions much faster, I should say, correct conclusions much faster uh, than other players um, because you know they already know the answer and they just have to have a reasonable explanation for why their character would figure that out. Um, but just changing the name can can slow that process and make it feel more original. So let's use let's use cackle fever. Let's get that URL um, and we'll say the disease. We're gonna call it a let's say it's a reskin of Cackle fever. Uh, and put that on there. So we get the hyperlink. Um, ooh, we got a minute. Let's hit the fantasy name generator and let's see what if we can come up with a good disease name for it. So under names, disease names. Ooh, yeah, magical names for sure. Some of these are, hmm, let's see here. Chain of rot, paranormal spasms, fire blood, and charm infection. Want something um, that kind of gives, you know, we could just call it cackle fever. You know, reskinning it, I mean, giving it a different name could be fun, but that, be very evocative, and it might it might allow you to make. You could have player. You have characters make um, um, 
make medicine checks, you know, as they examine the bodies to kind of determine what they think might have caused this. It could give them some insight that might be useful. Yeah, you know what? I, I reserve the right to change my mind on this, and, and, and you should too when you're working through the creative process of building this out. Um, to, to have an idea to follow down and go, you know what, let's, let's go a different direction because sometimes not every idea is the best idea for this particular event. Um, it's still really useful to reskin or to, to rename familiar things um, that your players might know the mechanics on uh, just to you know, help the game feel fresh for them and not feel like they already know the solutions. Um, but, uh, but in this case... Let's just make it straight cackle fever. That I, I think I think could be useful. And does the DMG have any guidance for determining identifying an infection here? Um, yeah, because lister restoration is something they have. They'll have access to at third level. So that. You know, it's something that we can throw out that risk of infection. So in that case, we might even, you know, modify our our commander so that he let's see our mummy. Let's see here. Right. Um, but instead of Mummy rot is text risk cackle fever. Cool. Yeah, because that will make that will make him a little more appropriate to this situation. But we still get the vibe of that that disease ridden creature, right? Uh, that's that spreads that. And now we have something that we can say, you know, such and such creatures are infected with this or, or are contagious with cackle fever, um, like the ghouls. Um, new disease, say, um, contagious with cackle fever. That could be useful. But, you know, can't get diseases from ghosts, so we don't have to worry about that one there. Um, but also, it allows us to kind of pull out the heavy-handed need to have potentially enough removed curse scrolls in here um, to preserve our players. So you can get rid of that. Um, unless you're going for a really, like, you know, hey, your character might die, come with a backup character kind of adventure, which is okay if that's what your table wants to do. Nothing wrong with that. Cool. Well, that's a big chunk here. We got kind of our three major encounters uh, in our glacial mine and our disease sorted out. Um, so, huzzah! That's a that's a good a good bit, and I think that's a good place for us to kind of wrap up here today. Um, anyway, uh, I do want to mention that we've been doing these every Saturday, and we will continue to do these every Saturday, with the exception of uh, if you're watching this in in real time. Uh, this coming Saturday, right? Um, which is, what's the, uh, we don't want to see that. Um, all right, uh, yeah, so this uh, this coming Saturday, so this, uh, I think it's the 6th, April 6th, I think. Um, but anyway, um, we won't have a live stream on that event or on that day, because uh, I'm going to be unavailable, but I will post a different uh, video. Um, and then we'll pick up the following Saturday with uh, uh, yeah, with our next our next live stream, part seven. Um, so anyway, I just want to say thank you all so much for joining me on this. Um, it's uh, it's great to share this with everybody. And if you have been enjoying this channel, um, if you want more of this kind of content, uh, please like the video and subscribe. Um, you know, every every like and subscribe to the channel really helps this grow and helps me keep doing this kind of thing. So uh, thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you next time.